keep bringing it local. Thank you so much for that, Dion. And uh, great, great uh, at risk of calling it a case study, but country study. Look at these, uh, the, the scraps of democracy. And as we pull the layers off and we keep coming a little more local here, uh, our next speaker, Lindsey Brown, has lots of experience locally dealing with some of these extreme contradictions of the crisis of democracy in British Columbia. She's a writer, uh, she, very high profile with the work around Vancouver Not Vegas Coalition, which defeated uh, gambling expansion in Vancouver. She's also uh, currently the Director of Communications for Commons BC, which creates and collects data visualization of BC's public resources. And of course, when we talk about the issues that we're talking about today around the rapaciousness of global capitalism, we, we have to look at these, um, the, what's at threat, which is the public resources and, and how are our public collective assets such as uh, financial resources of the public uh, and of the BC Crown, how are they used? Uh, we don't have to go too far back and remember um, Adrian Dix on Earth Day announcing that the NDP were going to oppose King or Morgan and then he was vilified in the corporate media as being uh, flip-flopping. But he actually didn't flip-flop, it was John Horgan who was flip-flopping because the next day he met with Ian Anderson, the president of Kinder Morgan, to reassure him that the NDP were not in fact against Kinder Morgan. And now he is the uh, the leader of the NDP and leader of the, the party, of the province. And I think uh, if we look at the that contradiction that the NDP has around its willingness to give lip service to UNDRIP, the rights of indigenous people, but at the same time uh, support jobs, union jobs, and at Site C, we really uh, can see some of these contradictions. And to help us unpack that, uh, we have Lindsey Brown, and I'm grateful to have you here today. Thank you. Thanks, Arvin. And uh, I, too, am thrilled to be here with David. Um, Chomsky's work and David's work, uh, along with, I think, have probably been the most useful to me as an activist. More and more, every year that goes by that I get, that I get involved in activist fights, I'm. It, it just is impressed on me how bang on Chomsky has been every single time and through all his, his fortunes in public, you know, in public opinion at times when he's popular or less popular, uh, it, 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 that has been a steady um, inspiration to me and the more I get involved in uh, activist fights or organizing against things like mega projects or um, in fact most of the things we seem to get involved in are, are uh, challenges to, to mega projects which is where so much of the corruption uh, of democracy seems to seems to be enacted these days uh, Chomsky comes back to me over and over and over again and, and some of the best quotes actually David um, mentioned in his talk, the, the, the question of privatization, for example, how public assets are driven into privatization and how that route is the route to corporate control of our, of our political system. Um, I'm, I'm really just going to talk, uh, I'm going to inventory some of the problems we face which are also barriers to democracy in trying to fight the Site C Dam, because it's, it's quite an amazing, it went, as I started to go through the list of the things that we were up against as a, as a fairly small David against a Goliath of corporate plus uh, state power. Uh, it's, it's an inventory of everything Chomsky has ever discussed and, and David has, has discussed and, and um, it dis disseminated through alternative radio. Uh, and I'm not going to do them in any particular order, but I'm, I will actually just quickly review the fight against the Site C Dam, um, probably for David's benefit and for uh, listeners on the radio. Uh, as probably many of people in this room know, it's the biggest project in BC history and it's one of the biggest in Canada. Uh, it's a, a massive 1950s style hydroelectric dam in the north of BC. Most of BC's power comes from the same river, the Peace River, which actually flows north into the Arctic. Uh, there are already two dams on that river, the Peace Canyon Dam and the, the, the much more famous Wacky Bennett Dam, Wacky Bennett being a, a right-wing premier from the, the 50s. Uh, and it's almost part of the BC identity, this idea that we are a clean, green, progressive province with clean, green power and we don't have coal-fired plants, mostly, and, and uh, you know, it has been a very hard for <laughs> For a, for a, a group of us to to try and overturn one that's it's not just a, a media perception but but almost part of the DNA of, of British Columbians, but uh, 
one of the, the difficulties is that these, the, it's become really obvious that not only is this a mega project extremely prone to corruption in, at a time when we don't need it and there's a massive surplus of electricity in the province, it is in fact a, a boondoggle intended to be a form of corporate welfare to enrich a lot of corporations, international corporations, um, but it is not even at this point in history even a clean source of energy but uh, I'm probably sure uh, most of the people in this room would know that. But you know, you have a huge methane release off the reservoirs, you have a methylmercury concentration, you have flooding of farmland that's absolutely critical for us to protect right now, class one farmland, which is actually really rare in BC. It's a mountainous province with not very much farmland. But, but on top of everything else, it's, it's treaty land. And that land is covered by a treaty, and not only is to build a dam on this extremely ancient hunting ground and, uh, and foraging ground for the local Danisa First Nations, uh, a number of nations actually um, on and abutting that the uh, the land that would be flooded, but um, it's it's enshrined in treaty rights, and it would be a violation of UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Mm -hmm. So. That's the issue. Um, this dam has been fought. It's part of a. It's part of a series of dams that would actually allow. And this is another issue that hasn't really been dealt with. But actually, allow water to be shipped south to the U.S. It's sort of the last jewel in a long crown that would allow allow water to be shipped through Alberta into the states where the Oglala Aquifer is running out of water. So it's it's a really complicated issue, and that was one of the things we were up against. What happens when you are a, a group of um, First Nations people and small groups and individuals all coming together to fight a mega project. Um, they've been fighting it up there in the north of the province, which is very far away from here. I think a lot of people don't realize that BC is the size of France and Germany and Luxembourg together, and organizing across these huge differences is that that's one of the first barriers to democracy. How do you, it's like, um, I don't want to say American, I'll say USian because it's David Stern, but in, in your system you have a rural urban divide that's become very clear in the Trump era. Well, I, I shouldn't say his name. Um, but, uh, here we have something similar. We have this very colonial setup of urban centers in the south and um, vast tracts of land to the north. There's a divide between um, communities there and in the, and in the south. Uh, you know, that, that whole rural urban divide is, is a serious problem. We have, uh, we have an electoral system that's a serious issue for us. We have two parties that are looking more and more identical through First Past the Post. Canada's First Past the Post system is a little different than yours. You've got the Electoral College, but still it's that same difficulty of where it supposedly provides stability of government, but in fact it skews uh, everything over to the right. Um, we have uh, a huge amount of deregulation. Um, environmental assessment in particular. I, I don't even like to call it deregulation, it's almost re-regulation over several decades in, f in mm -hmm. favor of the corporate interest. But in short, there's a massive gutting of both oversight of, of non-environmental issues and, and a gutting of environmental assessment. Um, we had the increasing privatization of a public utility. BC Hydro is the sort of jewel in the crown of, of the commons, of the public asset in, in British Columbia. Um, quite an amazing public utility, which under the last 16 years, as not including the, the last six months of the new NDP government, but over the, si over the 16 years of our, our quite far-right government here, calling themselves oddly the BC Liberals, um, we had a gutting of BC Hydro, so you had uh, um, Indebting BC Hydro to private corporate projects, so that we, there's a, the, a type of uh, small dams on multiple rivers across the province called IPPs, independent power projects. And uh, a, a, an energy act was changed by the former government to, uh, to compel BC Hydro to buy power off these private companies, which put it into approximately over, over the next few uh, 20 to 30 years will, will amount to a debt of 50 billion dollars. That's what the contracts are worth. Uh, to hide, to hide the increasing indebtedness. To, and, and we had a, a, an energy um, surplus at the time. We, we were giving power away to California and neighboring uh, jurisdictions. 
so we couldn't make up the, what what we were paying out to these private companies. We were all pals of the Premier Gordon Campbell. Uh, so you, you had this increasingly uh, increasing um, demolition of the health of this amazing <coughs> public utility. Uh, so it's exactly what Chomsky, and I kept thinking of Chomsky, you know, it's that same thing, you take a public asset, you drive it into the ground, you indebt it, you, you ransack it for private profit, you make the populace pay, uh, and, and then you raise its rates so that everyone is angry and then everyone clamors for the privatization of the utility. That is effectively, and that is how I got involved in the, in the fight against the dam originally. Um, then we have other issues. Again, it's the media. We have the worst monopolization of media in British Columbia in the country. We have always had two major papers in the province. Both of them have always been owned by the same corporation. Uh, that corporation sells to different corporations down the road, but the fact is we have this monopolization. Um, it's, been a t it's been an interesting year because in the fight we had to also cope with an election. And it, was the, it was an election when um, many of us hoped that this so supposed Social Democratic Party, the NDP, would get into power because that was our only chance of stopping this dam. It was a, a dam that the BC Liberals, despite a joint uh, provincial and federal uh, review panel, um, had clearly warned against it. The BC Utilities Commission, which is supposedly an independent regulator, not very independent, not even what you'd call arm's length, not even wrist length, but <laughs> nevertheless a, a regulator had, had uh, rejected many times in the past, but then you had this increasingly renegade, renegade right-wing government ramming this dam through. So we, th there we were at the position of this dam. The only way of stopping it was to elect a different party, which of course we all know how that turned out. We, it, we uh, many of the activists and, um, and even First Nations and organizers involved in the fight dropped everything, stopped mentioning Site C, and put everything we had into getting the NDP elected despite signs. I mean, you could see the resistance inside the party from space that, that this was not going to be an issue. We were, it, they weren't necessarily going to be a win, but the idea was, well, perhaps we can, we can pressure them enough once they're in uh, to, get this, to get this thing stopped. But, you know, it was barely mentioned. It was, there was no promise to actually stop it. it. It ended up being a tiny little section on page 63 of the, pan, the, the, the campaign platform. Uh, many MLAs running, who, all of whom were clearly aiming to be cabinet ministers, had said, had campaigned strongly against the dam while the other party was in power, but became more and more mute. Anyway, we got them elected, and then we had the, the internal problem of all of those who had been NDP partisans in the fight, which is a very large coalition of small groups and um, individuals, but many of whom had uh, both union and um, NDP partisan affiliation, not wanting us to attack the new NDP government because it's it's our government. They were uh, you know they were on our side and they're our only chance. So there were there was a lot of internal tension regarding how strongly can we protest against this new government. And then when you have the next barrier to democracy, which is this this uh, m media uh, monopoly that I have already discussed. <laughs> You've got a media that is already uh, going to be ranged against the new government, supposedly socialist or so social democratic government. They haven't talked socialism for a long time, so I think we can dispense with that part. But you, you, uh, we didn't want to uh, be the many in our side. Not me. I was. Uh, I've always been for the bad cop um, approach. But um, having been involved in other fights, where I know if you don't kick and scream, it is really, really difficult to stop anything. But, you know, there, were, there was a lot of caution, and nobody wanted to sound or, or give fuel to the right-wing media to stop, this, to stop this project. And so we were being very nice. People were using their, you know, their 30 years of, of personal relationships with cabinet ministers and getting, trying to get meetings. And then, <coughs> coming to the end of the list, although it, it goes on and on, I'm, I'm really only giving a, a very truncated overview, you had the unions. And in British Columbia, you've got a, always a problem with the unions where you have the brown unions and the public center, uh, sector unions. Um, when you're involved in a, on a fight that has an environmental component or is against a mega project of any kind, you always find that the unions are on the other side. And for, it, it, it's really difficult for people on the left to be fighting these fights and fighting against the union movement. 
you have allies in the public sector unions in BC. It's the BCGEU, which was, uh, which was our best ally in this, who refused to make a statement uh, on our behalf, which created a huge amount of anger. And then you have people on your own side, inside the fight, uh, and inside the, the, the sort of the larger NDP voter base criticizing you for being some kind of right-wing plant because you're, you're criticizing unions. But the unions are US-based, union-supported. They, they, they uh, actually endorsed in the last election the right-wing candidate, not the NDP. They had uh, allied themselves into a, a kind of a, a lobby block called the AHC, the Allied Hydro Council. It's got an office out in Burnaby, and that involved not just those unions, the, the trades unions or the dirt unions, as some people call them, the, the, the concrete workers, the, all of the construction unions, uh, but the ICBA, which was um, a business, a very right-wing business association, which had a stake in wanting these small contracts for the stamp. So there's not, almost nothing that Chomsky talks about that we weren't up against. And what do you do if you're a little grassroots group uh, who doesn't have the support of the big ENGOs and NGOs even? I mean, the big environmental, non-governmental organizations in BC were completely absent on this fight. We were left <laughs> absolutely and utterly alone. There were a few groups, the Sierra Club, the Western Canada Wilderness Committee, Yukon to, to Yellowstone Initiative, which is an ecological and uh, wildlife group, and um, Council of Canadians and Amnesty. <coughs> but none of the, where was Dogwood? Where were, where were some of the other big ENGOs? Well, you find that in fact, they have their own logic First of all, I think there's two things. I think they were um, very close to uh, the NDP government in a lot of ways. Um, it sounds a little tinfoil hat, but I think there was a little bit of horse trading that maybe they would leave Site C alone. If the NDP were really good on Kinder Morgan, they would support that, but they would give them a pass on Site C. That's a controversial thing. I've gotten in trouble for, <laughs> for floating that theory in the past. But um, <laughs> there is a, there's, a, there's a much clearer logic with the NGOs, and that is that they don't really want to get involved in issues where they can't list build, where, they, where it's not really easy to raise money. So they'll say things like, well, yeah, no, our, our donors aren't interested in that. Well, your, owners, your donors weren't interested in pipelines and tankers either until you raised a communication strategy and got them really riled up, and that's when the money started to flow in. Why are you not doing this with the largest project? in BC with the longest list of environmental impacts of any project, including the Kinder Morgan pipeline. So there was this bizarre sort of uh, hypocrisy, but the silence was almost deafening. So there we were, this little group of, you know, loose network of, of uh, um, long-time activists, <coughs> grassroots groups, local groups in the Peace River, um, the uh, West Moberly First Nation, the, uh, in collaboration with the Prophet River First Nation, who together formed a group called Nanwadi, which I hope everybody can support. They have a big court case coming up. Um, as do the Blueberry First Nation, a uh, different Supreme Court case coming up very soon. Um, so that's what we were up against. I'm probably missing out many points. But it becomes very obvious that uh, it's extremely difficult to fight a fight that isn't, for example, based in your local area that's right on the, you know, that's, that, that people don't really understand that they have an interest in. Even when you're talking about the fact that people's hydro bills are going to double, which they already have in Newfoundland with their eerily identical project, the Muskrat Falls Dam, uh, where, which is much farther ahead and rates have already begun to catastrophically rise, which is producing an unbearable burden on the poor. I think their hydro rates are $1,600 a month. Uh, now we're going to go up much <coughs> further, which means people are choosing between heating and eating. They're choosing between heating and prescription medication. I mean, it, it's, it's a huge poverty <coughs> issue, and yet we found it extremely difficult to organize. You also have huge amounts of money being put not only into the parties where you have the um, steel workers, which is the biggest US-based union, which is angling for this dam, uh, they had, they gave the NDP two, almost two million, they and their uh, associated group gave almost two million dollars between January 2016 and now, um, before the, the cap on donations. 
So you've got, they, they've got access to each cabinet minister of when the NDP got in. Bill Thielman, <coughs> there, one of their main spokespeople, got easy access to every single cabinet minister, whereas on our side we had the help of uh, extremely experienced global level experts in energy and the energy transition, and we couldn't get them in. We were trying everything. People had to go, Harry Swain had to use his, his uh, status as a constituent of Carol James, the finance minister, to actually get a meeting with her. Um, yeah, woman. So, since I'm about to go over, um, I'm going to quickly switch to what we can do. This is like a, uh, fighting a project like this is like a chess game, except it's, it's not a game. <laughs> so, given all of that arrayed, and the fact that, uh, as Chomsky likes to quote Gramsci on this, you have to stay positive, you have to play this uh, strategic chess game, one of the things that really struck me is that in doing strategy is that we don't think about allying ourselves or forming solidarity with other groups fighting other projects who might benefit from some of the same um, solutions that our fight would. I think what we do is we get into these very reactive positions where we, um, we think we just have to get the information out, we just have to get the information out to the public that this is not a green project and the, you know, that we need this farmland or we need, you know, it's, um, we have to support UNDRIP, we have to support the court cases. Yes, that's all true, but we have a couple of things, uh, we have a couple of possibilities uh, that it really strikes me as odd that we haven't followed up. One is, why is everyone not working for proportional representation? Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but we have a referendum in November. The NDP has said that they support it. They are going to do what I think of as damning with faint praise. They are going to, uh, they're not going to promote it properly. It's going to have a very poor referendum question that's going to be confusing. We need to be supporting this because it, this has been one of the problems all along. The NDP is supposedly our bulwark against the iniquities that we're dealing with, except that it has no pressure from the left. It has no pressure from its green flank. You can't get that without, however imperfect it is, without a proportional representation. And the other thing is anti-corruption legislation. We have almost none. The, the setup here is so colonial, uh, and we have, we have let all of these, whatever we had, erode. And I think what we need, and what a lot of the local journalists who, aren't, who no longer work for the big, because we don't really have any good um, sort of democratically based or environmental journalism anymore. It has so fully eroded, but we have people like Dermot Travis or Bill, Bob Mackin who are talking about uh, something equivalent to the Charbonneau Inquiry in Quebec, where you, and, they, and there's a really good list which I can send out, so if we could, I could post it on the, the page for this, um, for this event, but where you have transparency legislation, you have a whole, and then you have an independent commissioner who actually goes this, which is fully funded. It, it strikes me that these two things, that if all of the groups fighting the projects that uh, so many of us are sort of atomized into fighting separately, if we, if we started to look for some of these solutions, this might actually make short of revolution, which I don't think is going to come tomorrow, and we don't have, you know, I don't have time for, uh, time to wait for. Uh, I think this is, this is probably one of the solutions. I could talk more, but it's an extremely complicated issue. Um, this more than any other that, uh, that I have personally worked on. So it's really difficult to communicate, and that's why I think we, we, need, to, we need to come together for perhaps in some larger solidarity initiatives for long game, large solutions. Okay. Uh, thanks, and thanks, David. <laughs>